write as crazy and as and as beautiful as you possibly can in order to get it made. always had a quote in the script it was something something blood you know it was something that was it was about blood as soon as we put that in we're like oh now people seem to be grounded in that something weird is about to happen it's funny when people miss that quote which people do right they come late to the screenings and they look at their phones or whatever they miss kind of the the foreboding of what's to come and they get really terrified when the blood is actually coming but also, I wanted to give a promise. I wanted to promise the audience that if you stick around, you will know the riddle of this, this sort of, it's a quest, right? And, and this is the promise. I, 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 I keep that promise, as you know. And, and as soon as, I mean, you think I've lost that promise for a very long time. And, but of course, this is, this is it. This is the key to the story. It's the key to understanding what this film is about but then also Brock like I start I uh, I know there's a bunch of screenwriters here but probably a lot of directors too but like I feel it was important to me to start in a very surrealist way and if you rewatch the film you would notice that I have placed the camera where no camera could be placed so in order to do that sort of tilt down I had to be on a skyscraper or a helicopter or something like that. It's way too high for a cherry picker. It's way too up for a crane. So that is a full CGI shot actually. And that is to essentially distance ourselves from reality as far as we can from the get-go. So people, you know, a lot of critics have been like, Nicholas blatantly throws in surrealism at the end. I'm like, no, dude, like it's from the beginning, man. It's from the very, very start. So M M Mother Couch, the setting of Mother Couch in a furniture store felt very doable. However, when we started location scouting for, for the furniture store, we soon realized that in order to make the vision come clear, we have to be able to move around walls and really fuck with people in terms of where they are and stuff. So we ended up building the furniture store, which actually helped us a lot in terms of just bending the reality of the story. Well, how we did that though, was that we found a house that we all liked as mother's house. So we just did a replica of that house when we built the furniture or this the old bits furniture. So is it something where you kind of wrote maybe like the, the cheapest film possible to film and then started to expand upon that as the resources came in? Is that how you would say? That's exactly it. Right. That's exactly how I did it. Yeah. That's really a good way to put it. So just a few more like linear steps, everything you, you've authorized to the film uh, for about a thousand dollars. You kind of took a chance on that. Then you said you attacked the actors first and then went looking for funding. Is that, was that kind of the process? The real truth is that we did sort of that at the same time. I think we had a bunch of offers on the script before any actors were attached. But then the final go was when all the actors were attached. So it happens sort of at the same time. And that's probably a different, you know, session because fi financing movies are the whole thing, right? I think... When you get to a point where the script feels ready to go out to actors, you need to be able to have as strong of a script to go out to financiers, to have a bulletproof script, basically. Because a financier, if an actor is attached, very rarely, for indie movies especially, a financier would be like, yeah, I don't like that character. Like, if they say that, then just like, don't go with that financier. Mm -hmm. But the good thing about, you know, have play like playing around with good actors is that they kind of essentially scare good financiers off from their opinion. So much earlier, you just give me the right directions. You know, this has got something to do with Paul. It's always got something to do with Paul. Jenny, 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 Jesus. Mom? Oh, how nice of you to come. You really didn't have to. What's going on? How are you, honey? How long have you been here? How long has she been here? Two, three, three hours. hours. 
I mean, you wrote this to direct it. Like, is that something, if you were a screenwriter trying to sell a script, would you be so bold as to write that in the, is that on the paper or not on the paper? That's right. Let me read you what's on the paper. The first line in the script is, here we go, script, blue draft, October. Here we go. The first line of the script is, Title sequence, you know, those bombastic title sequences from great movies back in the day when mystery, big drama, love and all that are promised over a bunch of graphically designed names. Well, this is one of those title sequences. Insert title, mother couch. So whatever that is, I mean, you don't have to necessarily explain until you get into production, but they know it's going to be a big bombastic title sequence. Do you see yourself, I mean, in the ones you mentioned, like, you know, the same ones I grew up watching, Tarantino and Nolan and the Coen brothers, they are writer-directors. Do you see yourself as a director who writes or a writer-director, or is it like all it's a little bit more blurry than that? I think it's blurry. I don't know, man. Like, I think I write because I haven't been sent a script that I like, basically. I'm a very picky reader. I have a, a great respect of words and the written word, and I love to play around with words. But if someone sends a script along that I love, then I'll direct it, you know? Like, I don't have any of those. Right now, I just want to direct really interesting stories with really, re really interesting characters that I can connect to, and I can, you know, kind of fill with life. So right now I write because I haven't read anything I like, you know? So what does your other time look like? Or you know, before this film got made, you were searching for stories that you enjoyed and then you found, felt kind of fell in love with this short story? Sort of. Prior to Mother Couch, I've written four screenplays, four full screenplays on spec, uh, stories that I had to tell somehow why I don't know. And I think you don't have to know really. But in retrospect, they're all very sort of juvenile and especially my first two. I was certain my fourth, the one I wrote right before Mother Cow, was the best thing I've ever written. And I was certain it was going to be made, but it was way too big to, in retrospect. It was, uh, it was a lot of locations, a lot of characters, a lot. It, like I knew on a subconscious level that this is going to be hard to make. I got an advice. It's to try to enjoy it, you, you know, in every step, like it's, it's so hard making a movie, like from writing to get setting it up all up or whatever. I think it's important to know that it should be also enjoyable because um, everything is so far from enjoyable. Like what I'm going through now, it's horrible reading a review that says you suck basically, right? Knowing that you've put every waking second into this thing for five years, you poured your soul, your heart, everything into it for someone to tell you it sucks. Like regardless, even though I know that I shouldn't give a fuck and that I should be proud of what I, like that still hurts, right? So it, from that to producers not allowing you to do certain things to actors wanting to rewrite your favorite lines, everything is really fucking hard all the time and heartbreaking all the time. So try to enjoy that process because if you just find a way to look at it from a pers like a tiny bit of a bird perspective it's kind of fun like it's kind of like you know today my my colleague walks in he's like oh congrats on 32 percent on rotten tomatoes and we just laugh about it right like that's incredible that's like so they truly, they're so offended about like they truly hate my movie which so many people love and i I mean, you got it. What what else can you do? Like, that's funny because it doesn't represent who I am. It doesn't, that's like, it's just funny. And you have to laugh about it because otherwise you can just kill yourself. I encourage you to read. I just did a great interview with Ruben Östlund, with one of my heroes. And yeah, I try to gather and collect the heroes that I look up to as much as I can. And I'm a super annoying dude. Like, I just call them. I'm like, should I trust this? Like, is this true? Like, whatever. And one thing Ruben said to me early on, because we had a lot of walkouts in Toronto when we premiered uh, last year. It was basically me and Harmony Corinne that had the most walkouts at TIFF. And then I called Ruben. I was like, fuck. Like, it's, it's, it's like, no, Nicholas, no. Just know that it's already a success.
And I think that's such a beautiful way to look at it, you know, like it's already making movies, making what we do is already a success. And yeah, just enjoy it, you know.